Good morning. Today is Wednesday, August 31st, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning in to Worldwide KFUO, Christ for You, Anytime, Anywhere. How do you listen to the show? Over the air, online at kfuo.org, or as a podcast? No matter how you connect, I'm glad you're here. Settle in with your Bible and get comfortable. Thy Strong Word is underwritten by the generous folks over at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Learn more about what they do at lhfmissions.org. And if you have questions or comments about today's show, or maybe you just want to say hello, you can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E at gmail.com. Today we open our Bibles to Romans chapter 12, and we'll be digging into all 21 verses this morning. And to help guide our scripture shovels, we're joined today by the Reverend Thomas Eckstein, pastor of Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota. Pastor Eckstein, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Great to be back. You are in North Dakota. Now, I'm in the southwestern corner of Minnesota. Uh, I don't know where Jamestown is. Where is that for those of us who aren't geographically blessed? Well, first of all, uh, to uh, bring a little any confusion, North Dakota is part of the United States. So I <laughs> want to clarify that. Nice. Uh, but yeah, if people know where Fargo is, uh, Jamestown is about 100 miles straight west on i-94 and then you uh, run into jamestown and and we're famous for the world's largest buffalo statue so there's not much else to do in town but you can go see the buffalo statue (laughs) that's great my first call was in Purim, minnesota which is you know about an hour and a half east of fargo so yeah i kind of familiar with that area up there and yeah the world's largest buffalo statue yeah i love it so you know (laughs) you are a regular uh guest of the show I am fairly new, so, you know, just for the sake of myself and any listeners who might just be tuning in for the first time, share a little bit about you, your congregation, and how the Lord is working through you both. Yeah. Well, as far as being in KPL, actually, I've been doing this forever. I I, uh, started uh, uh, being on various programs of KPL back in... uh, the uh, 1999 when I was serving a congregation in the St. Louis area. And then uh, when I moved up here to North Dakota for another call in 2005, uh, I I kept doing it and uh, enjoy doing it. Uh, As far as my congregation here, Concordia Lutheran in Jamestown, I've been here for 17 years now and things are going wonderfully. Uh, We've pretty much uh, came out of the woods as far as COVID, although we still have a few little issues here and there where we're pretty much back to normal. And um, uh, I'm the full pastor here, and uh, we do have a full-time deaconess as well, which is a real blessing to us. She works with youth and and, uh, women's ministry and helps me with social ministry and the like. So, uh, uh, yeah, we've uh, been up here now for 17 years. We we also, uh, uh, our congregation hosts an orphan green train branch in Jamestown. And so we're very engaged with that. My wife is the branch manager at this point. And uh, so uh, we do a lot of ministry in that area, too. So we keep busy. Well, that sounds great. It sounds like the Lord definitely has you busy in that area. And it's just amazing. That's one of the blessings so far, for sure, of being the host of this show, is I get to hear from pastors and all the amazing ways that God is working through congregations across the country. Yeah, so it's, it's wonderful to hear. Today, we will be covering Romans chapter 12, and I say we just dig right in. Uh, before we begin, though, would you like to kind of catch us up? What was happening in chapter 11 that led us to what seems to be a little bit of a shift for Paul at the beginning of 12. Yeah, well, uh, uh, in a nutshell, chapters 9 for 11 um, uh, are kind of a section unto themselves, although I would argue that it does flow out of Romans chapter 8. You know, Paul's whole argument uh, in chapters 9 through 11 is, okay, now that in the first eight chapters he's established that we're saved by grace through faith based on the work of Christ alone, he deals with the mystery, okay, how does this fit in to the whole salvation history of Israel in the Old Testament? And I, I don't have time to touch on every point he says in chapters 9 through 11, but, but in a nutshell, he's saying that Israel 
is more than ethnic Israel. I would, when you think of it, we already know this in, in Genesis 12, when God tells Abraham that through his seed, all nations will be blessed. And so already in the Old Testament, we see that Israel is more than ethnic Israel. It's, it's all people who are gathered into the Israel of God, the, the kingdom of God. And so in Romans 9, Paul talks about the fact that not all who are from Israel, ethnic Israel, are Israel, the spiritual Israel which is made up of ethnic Israel and Gentiles who believe in Jesus. And then one thing that Paul makes very clear at the end of, of Romans 11, which I think is key to understanding Romans 12, is that in, in Romans 11, verse 32, he says, for God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Now, there's two important things there. There's an echo of Romans 3, where, where Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, we're all under the law. Uh, but then God makes it clear that he desires to have mercy on all. And, and here we get the clear teaching, and there's other scriptures too that stress this, of, of, of the universal atonement. So, so we don't disagree with some of those Christians who say that Christ only died for the elect or only died for some. No, the Bible's clear he died for all. And so the, the reason some people end up outside of God's mercy is not because God didn't want to save them, but because they have rejected uh, the God who did everything he could to save them through his son. But with that said, starting with Romans 12, we're going to see that now that we've established that, that our salvation depends from beginning to end on God's mercy, uh, we will now understand uh, how our life of sanctification plays into that. In other words, we don't strive to obey God out of fear. We don't strive to obey God because we're trying to merit his righteousness. Instead, the life of sanctification simply flows from who we are in Christ based on God's mercy to us in him. And uh, I'll let that be my summary. <laughs> well, wonderful summary. You know, Levin ends with verse 36 that says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. The glory is God's because that just what you said, he has come to save us from our sins regardless of who we are. Let's begin then. We're just going to maybe read the first th uh, few verses, uh, maybe just the two first two verses of Romans chapter 12, to get us started. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Holy Bible. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now that's just two verses, Pastor, but I think there is an important point to be drawn out here, especially as it comes to not only appealing to God's mercy, but how we are to be related to the world. Should we be conformed or transformed? He makes it pretty yeah. obvious, but you know, lead us through that, brother. Yeah, oh, there's so much here. Well, first of all, I want to stress again that now that Paul begins talking about what does this new life in Christ look like, he, he wants to make it very clear that in view of God's mercy, uh, we we strive to obey God in light of the fact that he loves us and we love him, and we are already completely fully saved in Jesus Christ. So in other words, our life of sanctification has nothing to do with finishing our justification. <laughs> uh, and let me say that in less theological language. Um, uh, trying to live according to the will of God has nothing to do with us making him uh, willing to forgive us or love us. He already does that fully and completely in Christ. It's a done deal in him. And so now uh, our, our, our obedience flows purely from love. It, it, it has nothing to do with fear. It has nothing to do with getting closer to God, so to speak. It's just simply about living out the, the full forgiveness, salvation, and love that God has given us. So that's what he means by in view of God's mercy. Then he goes on to say, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, at first, that seems to be a contradiction because normally sacrifices are dead. <laughs> um, and so what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Well, well, uh, now that we are alive in Christ, uh, our whole lives are offered up to God uh, uh, as a gift to, to honor him and praise him. 
and 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 worship him. And so uh, we now view obedience not as, oh, I'm doing this because God's going to zap me if I don't, or I'm doing this because this will make God love me more. No, uh, I, I'm obeying God. I'm conforming to his will um, because uh, this is how I honor him and bring glory to his name. This is who I am as his dearly loved child. And so to, to offer my body as a living sacrifice is my act of worship, as uh, Paul says. So, so when we think of worship, it's not merely what we do on Sunday morning. In fact, I would argue on Sunday morning we're there to receive primarily, although we do worship. But, but the thing is, uh, worship is our whole life. Our, our, our vocation as God's people is, is an offering to God in praise to him. Um, obviously God doesn't need anything from us, but he calls us to love and serve our neighbor. And that's how we honor him and glorify him. Uh, one other comment finally in, in, in two verse two, he makes it very clear that because we are new creations in Christ, we should not be conformed to the world, but we should learn what God's will is. Now, at first, this is a mystery because on the one hand, uh, Paul says, uh, especially in Romans 6, that, that we, we've come from death to life. We're new people in Christ. Uh, so why would he even tell us to not conform to the world? Well, as we find in Romans 7, even though we're new creations in Christ, we still have that sinful nature with us. We're still fighting with our sinful flesh and also the temptations of this world. And so there's always the danger uh, that we uh, might uh, uh, be led away from God. And so th there needs to be this constant awareness that we need to fight against uh, the, the world and our sinful flesh, all the time remembering that the victory has already been won in Christ. And so when we do recognize that in spite of our best efforts, that, that, that we still struggle with our flesh and, and, and fight against the temptations of the world, we remember what Paul says at the beginning of Romans 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So, so even though the law always accuses us by reminding us of our sins, the law does not accuse those who are in Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And the very last thing I want to say is this. One thing we're going to learn in Romans 12 is that once we are in Christ, we now view the law of God as it was meant to be. Uh, the law of God was never meant to be a way of earning salvation. Uh, the law of God was never meant to be something that accuses us. Instead, the law of God is simply a description uh, of what the life of love is to look like. And so when Paul says that Christians are no, no longer under the law, he doesn't mean that we can throw the Ten Commandments out now that we're saved. Well, what he means when he says we're no longer under the law is that we're no longer under the condemnation of the law. But now as Christians, we get to view the law as it should properly apply to us. And that is, this is what a life of love looks like. And in the rest of Romans 12, Paul will go on to describe that. The idea that the Ten Commandments, which represents the greater law of God as being a description of the Christian life, I think is a comforting one. Certainly, the law is used by the Holy Spirit on us in several ways. But it is that third use where we look at that and say, this is how God has called me to live. And it yeah. better fills out this idea of do not be conformed to this world, that being a disciple of Christ is about being transformed. But being conformed to this world, that is something that I think believe that Christians are really going to have to grasp more and more as time marches on, especially American Christians. It was really yeah. no different back then. Because first Peter 1.14, Peter says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In First John 2, John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And elsewhere, the scriptures tell us that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. That's Jesus. So there is this constant message that being a disciple of Jesus Christ, whether you're in the first century or whether you're here in 2022, is about connecting to God's law in such a way that we live it out as a you know, living testament to our faith, right? Our faith produces in us these good works that help our neighbor, and in that way, we're not being conformed to the world. But brother, you know, I'm sure you see this too, people struggling with this idea of how Christianity and the things that the Bible and Christ teaches and confesses and the things that we're to believe, teach, and confess, 
just don't match up with what the world's saying more and more. Right. One, just one example, uh, and, and this has really infected the church, sadly. One example is our whole culture's view of sexuality. Um, uh, you know, there are many Christians, sadly, and this is the fault, I think, of the church. We've done a lousy job teaching on this. But, but many Christians have learned about what sexuality is, not from Scripture, but from the culture. And so you, you have many Christians who say they believe in Jesus, and yet their lives of sexuality has been totally conformed to the world. And so here's the importance of finding out what God's will is, learning from his word about all things, including sexuality. And God has a lot to say about that. And it's important to know that when we learn from God's word about something like sexuality, it's not merely, uh, oh, here's the bad stuff, shame on you, although there's a place for that, but also to learn about the good place for what God intended for our sexuality, um, how it's meant to be a blessing when used in conformity with God's original plan for, for this gift. But that's just exactly one area where, where uh, you know, Paul says, hey, the world has a totally different view of this, and it, it probably has influenced you more than you realize. So you need to be brainwashed in a good way, so to speak. <laughs> you need to have the Word of God wash away this, these cultural lies from your mind and have your mind renewed so that you you look at things from the point of view of God's loving will for your life. Yes, as we conform less and less to the world, we, of course, are set apart by the Holy Spirit. Through the Word, through the sacraments, we're strengthened to be the disciples that God has called us to be. However, sometimes this can lead to the idea that maybe we start to think we're better than other people. We're better than those people out in the world who have confusion over sexuality or whatever the issue is. So in Paul's next exhortation, which begins with verse 3, probably goes through verse 8, I'd say, um, we see that he's urging us towards humility. Let's hear those verses. Verses 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service, in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Brother, it's so much uh, to take apart here, and it applies deeply to our lives as members of the church, but also as individual Christians out in the world. What is Paul really trying to get across here? Well, two things. Uh, first of all, I, I think he makes it clear here that that even though we're all equally and completely and fully children of God in Christ, uh, within the body, at least this side of heaven, there are different maturity levels. Uh, some people are not as mature in the knowledge of God as others. However, that's where humility comes in, as you mentioned that. Uh, let's say you are one of the quote-unquote strong Christians who is more mature and you you understand God's word more than, than uh, other Christians who are still learning and, and escaping the, 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 the ways of the world. Um, rather than boasting of our knowledge and maturity in Christ, we need to remain humble and, and, and realize that we are to be servants of those who are still growing and learning and maturing, recognizing that we're still all equally holy before God in Christ based on his work for us. And um, with that in mind, uh, another point Paul makes here is that we all have different gifts and abilities, and and we should not categorize Christians based on uh, one Christian having a gift versus another. Uh, We have all been gifted in a certain way in our vocations to serve not only our world, but especially the church. And, And what we need to remember is that whatever gift or skill we may have, I think of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, what do we have that we have not been given? And so uh, whatever our skill may be, whether it's something that um, is sort of uh, hidden and not many people notice, uh, or or something the world thinks is all that important, or whether it's some skill that everybody notices and everybody thinks is valuable and and important, what, what Paul is saying here is that 
We're all part of one body. We all have a place in the church and we're all equally valuable and important before God. So humility is the key uh, uh, and God gets all the glory. Yeah, in Romans here, when he talks about these different gifts, you know, it reminds me that within the church, there really are different types of ministry and service to the church and to God's people and to, of course, the people outside the church. And some of these things seem a little bit more glamorous, maybe. I don't know if that's the right the word, but they certainly seem more enriching or more popular or people kind of pay attention to them more. And it's so important for us to understand the necessity of all of these gifts all working in the same to the same goal, to spread the gospel of Jesus and to benefit, of course, Christ's mission. So uh, how do we, as Christians in our church, how do we ensure that we're recognizing those Christians who have maybe gifts that aren't as visible, but not only celebrating them, but encouraging them in the gifts that they do? How does that look practically in the church? Yeah, you know, uh, and it's not only just in the church, but but even in our own homes, you know, um, appreciating uh, the little things our family members and especially our children do, uh, uh, and and not be belittling them like, oh, well, okay, that's a menial task. That's not all that important. But but but, but recognizing that everything we do as Christians flows from love and is an act of worship to God. So husbands noticing the the simple things their wives are doing uh, during the the week to make a house a home, and and not only uh, honoring that and thanking them for that, but but doing it in such a way too that we all give glory to God for the pl- privilege of doing this. And and within the congregation too, um, you know, making sure we 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 uh, go to people and 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 just say thank you for some of those little things that often go unnoticed. You know, wh- whether it's the janitor who cleans the toilets in the bathroom, or 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 the lady in the nursing home who who can't do anything for herself but prays for members of our congregation. You know, reminding people that hey, th- these are legitimate ways that God is working through people to serve the body as well, and we give thanks to Him for that. Yes, and key to all of that, as you've already said, is that we must remember that these are gifts of the same spirit as. Paul says elsewhere, we are given these gifts for the service and the benefit of each other. In my own congregation, you know, it comes uh, stewardship time, and they say, oh, pastor, we want to do a stewardship sermon, or we want to do a a stewardship event. And of course, the goal is to encourage people towards faithful stewardship. One of the things I suggested this year is that we recognize all the amazing ways that God has been providing for our congregation through the people. Let's highlight the to gifts of time and talent and treasure that people have been putting in. So instead of going out and sort of appealing maybe via the law for more of everything, let's right. celebrate how God has been working through us. And maybe that will encourage, inspire, and induce other people to join with them. But it's always important that we recognize that the church doesn't get anything done without the entire body working together in harmony the way God has designed it. Yeah, in fact, one thing I'm, I've often said that the reason I try to avoid having a stewardship Sunday is that technically every Sunday is a stewardship Sunday. <laughs> right. Because every Sunday we're focusing on the mercy of God in Christ, and from that flows our lives of vocation. Now, that doesn't mean we can't point out those various vocations and ways that we're serving. I, I like your idea of rather than, you know, the law, we're going to do more of this. Instead, celebrating what God has been and will continue to do through us. But, but then realizing that, that, that we don't have to necessarily single out every a Sunday to talk about stewardship, because whenever we're talking about the gospel and the fruit that Christ bears in our lives, that is stewardship. Right. Wouldn't the church be much poorer if we only celebrated Easter once a year, as opposed to celebrating the resurrection <laughs> and God's mercies every time we gather? In this text, he says about having different gifts, and he mentions prophecy and service, teaching, exhortation, generosity, leadership, mercy. I think some people misunderstand that word prophecy. Maybe you could explain that a little bit to us. We think of prophets. We think of the Old Testament prophets. We think of even John the baptizer. But prophecy in the New Testament church, how does that fit in with teaching and exhortation and generosity? Yeah. Well, even that word, that word can mean different things depending on the context. But m- m- most often, when people hear prophecy, they think of you know some some specially gifted individual who can foretell the future. You know, 
Uh, but, but here in this context, Paul is simply talking about the proclamation of the word. Um, and so technically what pastors are doing on Sunday morning in the pulpit is prophecy, at least is how Paul understands it here. And, uh, and you could even argue that 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 uh, lay Christians in their within the mutual conversation and consolation of the brethren, as Luther talks about, um, as we share God's word with one another, and especially with the unbelievers of this world, that can be understood as prophecy in that sense of foretelling of, of God's word, especially His precious gospel. And so, uh, uh, prophecy in that sense is so important to Paul because it, it is the preaching, the proclamation, the teaching of God's word that. that that gives us life and 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 moves us to live our lives as a living sacrifice to God. You're right. Most people think of prophecy, perhaps today, even less of the Old Testament prophets and more of the you know Learning Channel Nostradamus type prophets. Right. And it's connected to this idea that they can foretell the future. Foretelling the future was a very small part of what the prophets of the Old Testament did. In fact, I would say it's incidental. The prophets were those who spoke the word of God as it was given to them. Sometimes that included what would happen in the future. Sometimes it included what was happening in the moment. And when we talk about prophecy today, as you so perfectly uh, you know, elucidated, prophecy is about speaking that word of God. It ties in with all these others. It's not that we should have teachers in the church and uh, exhorters in the church and mercy people in the church, and we have to have a couple prophets too. But a lot of these things aren't necessarily distinct gifts, but ones on a scale that find themselves at various levels throughout all the members. Yes, yes. And, and even though some people might have one, uh, be more skilled in one gift than another, I think you're onto something when when you say that that there's a lot of Christian individuals that, that have multiple gifts. Um, in, in these areas. And I think Paul here is simply pointing out that, 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 that we need all these gifts to build up the body and no one gift uh, should lead to arrogance. Uh, but we, we, we exercise all these gifts in humility, knowing that it is God who has given them to us and is working through us. And one last note about gifts before we head to our break, sort of a practical point I think that lots of people, they'll take these spiritual gift inventories, and I'm not necessarily speaking against them. You know, they could be useful in helping you discern what types of things you're interested in or what you think you might be good at. But one of the advice, pieces of advice that I give folks who are looking for ways to serve in the church is to, you know, yeah, go home and pray about it, but actually just go sign up. Just go do it. You'll find out if you enjoy it, if God's giving you gifts for it, if indeed he's calling you to serve in that way, after you do it. Because if you go home and you say, well, I'm going to pray about it, I always wonder, well, what are you waiting on? You know, is, is God going to speak to you and say, yes, go teach Sunday school? Probably yeah. not. So go teach Sunday school. See if it's a gift that you have. Uh, and be understanding, if you're in leadership at a church, that you know, if people are going to start trying things, that you uh, are merciful to them if they do find out that perhaps they don't have a skill set for that. But so my advice to folks listening, I guess, the listeners out there, is if you're in a church and they're looking for people to help with things, and I recently said this to my congregation, just do it. Just go sign up. You know, I taught, or I shouldn't say taught, I substitute taught at my children's school in Connecticut while I was still there. I don't know why I signed up for it, my one day off a week, and I said, well, I'll use that to be a substitute teacher. And they said, well, which grades would you be interested in? And I told them, oh, I, I think I'd be better off in the high school you know, or middle school. I wouldn't be good with the elementary school. And so they assigned me to the middle school, and it took about a few weeks of that before I said, yep, no more middle school, please. And then <laughs> they, they said, well, would you be willing to do the elementary school? And I said, yes, I'm here to serve, of course. They put me in the middle school, I mean the elementary school, pardon me, and I loved it. I loved it. I never in a million years thought that I would enjoy teaching kids first, second, third grade, but it was uh, the rewards of, the, of my time serving. So you just never know, folks. You know, the Lord has given us so many gifts and interests. Go and try them out. See what the Lord has in store for you. Brother, anything else before we head to our break that you want to leave the listeners with? No, I think that's it. We have a lot more to cover coming up, so. Okay, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are going to take a break, but when we return, Pastor Eckstein and I will continue our discussion of Romans chapter 12. We'll see you on the other side.
Take a look around you. Look closely. Immigrants in the United States and their U.S.-born children now number about 81 million people, or 26% of the population. So chances are, there's someone right in your community who doesn't speak English as a first language and who doesn't know Jesus. The Lutheran Heritage Foundation can help by providing you with free Lutheran books translated into over 90 languages. See their complete list of catechisms and Bible storybooks at lhfmissions.org. Friends, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo, and with me today is the Reverend Thomas Eckstein, pastor of Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota. Pastor, before the break, we were just finishing up a talk about different gifts, but there is so much to this text, I think we should keep going. And so I'm going to read verses 9 through 21. That's the rest of our chapter, and we'll spend some time digging in. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, brother, to be honest, I can't wait to get to the burning, heaping coals on his head, but we have to start at verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Get us started. Where's Paul taking the conversation? Well, first of all, of course, there's a ton of things he says here, but I love the fact that he begins, let love be genuine. And then the first statement he says is, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Now, the reason I think this is so important is that in our culture today, and this has even infected the church, is that love is understood more in the sense of toleration or even affirmation. In other words, if you're loving, oh, you, you can never tell somebody that they're wrong or that they need to, you know, stop doing what they're doing. But here, uh, uh, Paul makes it very clear that love that is genuine actually abhors what is evil and deliberately seeks out the good. Or I think of what Paul says in what people call the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. In, in 1 Corinthians 13, 6, he says, love does not rejoice in evil, but instead rejoices with the truth. And so here we see that love, precisely because it's love, makes a distinction based on God's word between good and evil. And love not only rejoices in the good, but actually is disgusted with evil. And that's why people need to realize sometimes people have a hard time understanding, well, how can God be love and hate sin? My response is precisely because God is love, he hates sin. What, what we need to realize is that the opposite of love is not wrath. The opposite of love is apathy and indifference. So if God were love and he looked at sin and said, whatever, I don't care, well, then that would not be love. Uh, instead, the, the reason God has righteous wrath against evil is precisely because he is love. L love cannot put up with evil that destroys God's creation and harms his people made in his image. And that's precisely why Christ went to the cross. If, if God was indifferent towards sin, why would Christ need to be punished in our place of judgment? Uh, but there's where we see the awesome essence of God's love. He was willing to sacrifice his one and only son in our place of judgment to actually deal with our sin in the way uh, 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 his righteous wrath required so that we could be forgiven and have a new life with God. So with that in mind, Paul now goes on in, in verses 10 through the end of the chapter to tell us what is evil so that we can abhor it and to tell us what is good 
so that we can hold fast to it and rejoice in it. In our world today or in our society, our modern society, the idea is that if you disagree with me, you hate me. And this idea that hate is, of course, then the opposite of love. Well, God hates sin, and yet here we are filled with sin. God doesn't apathetically, as you put, hold back his mercy. In fact, he does something about sin because of love. Let love be genuine, and then by abhorring what is evil. I'm so glad that you brought out that point. So much in our world today is about standing up for what is true. True is determined by God's word, not by whatever the whims that we may have that's you know carrying us through the wind that blows. But being true lovers of people is to be honest with them. We recognize also, that, of course, that we too are sinners in need of salvation, and that's the position that we come from, not from a height that says, well, we're going to be hypocritically uh, judgmental over you, but think that we're just fine. No, in fact, we recognize that we're a sinner and that that's yeah. how we can tell. That's how we can tell. So we have this next section where he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. So starting with back at verse 10, love one another with a brother, brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, and then bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. It seems like he's describing how we should interact with fellow believers in basically challenging them to, to be the most loving. And then when it comes to those who persecute us, it sounds like we're supposed to treat them just as we would a fellow believer. How do we reconcile that with our own sinful natures that say, no, people who are against us, we should be against them? Yeah, and this is why we, we constantly need to live by the mercy of God in Christ, because even though as new creations we, 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 we want to obey God, uh, it's easier said than done because of that old sinful nature, especially bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Uh, we think of Jesus' own teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And, and that is something that only happens uh, through the gospel, changing our hearts. Um, now, I do want to add that this doesn't mean that we, we um, affirm or ignore the evil that people are doing to us or others. Uh, uh, nor does it mean that there isn't a place for, for defending ourselves. Uh, but what it does mean is that we should not wish hell, fire, and damnation on those who uh, persecute us. Instead, uh, we, we should uh, try to show love for them, and that would also include pointing out their error, by the way, uh, but especially by pointing them to the forgiveness and new life they have in Christ. And, and also realizing that, that, as Paul will go on to say in a bit here, uh, do not take vengeance. And uh, uh, we have to distinguish between defending ourselves in a moment where, where someone might be trying to hurt us in our family. There's a place for self-defense. But then vengeance is the idea, oh, I want to get back at this person because they deserve my wrath. Well, uh, no, uh, uh, that is uh, left in God's hands and God's hands alone. And here's the amazing thing. Even though we all deserve God's wrath, if, if I were to get what I deserve, I'd be in hell right now. But even though we all deserve God's wrath, what, what did we learn at the end of Romans 11? God has bound us all over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on us all. So if God wants to have mercy on his enemies, how can we pray that they end up in hell? Uh, that's really Paul's whole point here. So, so even though there's a place for defending ourselves, uh, we should realize that, that even when it comes to our enemies, rather than wishing they burn in hell, uh, we need to uh, love them, pray for them, and, and hope that God would change their heart. Absolutely. There's a couple other places in this text, too, that really stand out to me. And one of them is the live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Again, according to our sinful human nature— we want to be seen in the best crowds. We want to hang out with the right people. Who we think are the right people is heavily influenced by media. But the Bible tells us very clearly that the people we should be associating with are of all different socioeconomic statuses, all different walks of life. He's not telling us to avoid, of course, those who are in positions of power or wealth, but that we make sure that we find ourselves ministering to those who are in need, those who cannot give us anything in return, which, of course, mimics the way that God treats us through Christ. 
Yes. And and I think one reason Paul had to say that, especially in his day, is that in the culture of that time, uh, there was this, uh, among the Roman Empire, of course, you had the, the slave class, who, who they, they didn't treat even as human beings. Um, and then even within uh, 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 Judaism, th- there was this false theology that basically said, if someone's poor or sick, well, they must have done something to deserve that. You know, we kind of see that with Job's friends. It's like, Job, what did you do? You know, we're doing okay. So you must have done some whopper of a sin that this is happening to you. And and Paul's trying to remind us here, you know, we're not supposed to determine God's uh, a relationship with someone based on their circumstances. Just because someone is poor or sick or disabled or has special needs doesn't mean they're somehow more of a sinner than you. That's a horrible false theology. Instead, uh, we're, we're not only all equally guilty before God and Adam, but we're all equally precious children of God in Christ. And, and when that's understood, all these earthly, worldly, sinful distinctions uh, that, that we struggle with go away. And so uh, the, the lonely in our congregations, uh, whether they be, you know, uh, people who are poor or, or maybe people with special needs, or, or I even think of, of situations where, where you know, uh, uh, I think of my own congregation where we have people who have been let out of prison and uh, are repentant, but, but they have a, a history, so to speak. You know, how do we treat them? Do, do, we, do we keep hands off or do we welcome them as fellow forgiven brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, uh, I think that's what Paul was getting at here. Even if we don't go that route, and that background you gave is spot on, people believe that God was punishing those for being extra sinners or doing something wrong. But even today, oftentimes when people are in a situation that's not ideal, maybe they did go to jail. Maybe they did have their home repossessed. Maybe they are indigents for whatever reason. People will sometimes look at that and say, well, they must have made all the wrong decisions that led up to their situation, and it takes away the empathy that you might have for them. But even if that were true, and sometimes it is, not being haughty is recognizing that we too are just a very bad decision away from jail or having our house repossessed or any of these other fates that might happen to anybody. And so in that – with that regard, that just connects to – Paul's insistence that we be humble and have humility, it also connects with the idea that we go to people out of love because we've received love from Christ, not that they deserve it just because we didn't deserve it. Exactly. He then says, never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And then connected to that, he says, if possible, So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We pray often in our prayer of the church that we be allowed to live a peaceable life. We constantly pray for our leaders, for our president, our governors, all those in authority, magistrates, so that we can live a peaceable life. Pastor, give us an understanding of what it means to live a peaceable life. Why is that what a Christian wants? What is it first? And why is that what Christians should want? Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to remember that living a peaceful life doesn't mean that we ignore or tolerate or much less affirm a bad behavior. That's not what it means to be. Yeah, peace doesn't mean, okay, I'm going to go around with a plastic smile on my face and ignore all the bad things people are doing around me. No, but, but to live a peaceful life means that in spite of the bad things that people might be doing to me or in spite of the bad things I might be doing to other people, um, I, I will deal with those things in such a way that bring uh, a reconciliation rather than division and vengeance. And uh, and again, a, a quick side note, when it does come to vengeance, it's interesting. Um, uh, uh, there are situations where people do need to be punished and curbed in their sinful behavior. But Paul is clear that that, that is not the place for the individual Christian. Uh, Paul will go on in Romans 13 to talk about how he uses government to take vengeance and curb evil behavior. And so we, we should let uh, those who have that vocation handle that. But as far as we're concerned as individuals, he says, do not repay evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. So, um, uh, you know, the, the world says, don't get mad, get even. 
you know, the, the world says, you know, uh, that, that we should fight fire with fire. But here Paul says, you know, if someone does evil to you, don't respond in an equal manner. Instead, deal with them in such a way that, that even though you might have to point out their error and rebuke them, that you do it in humility and love with the idea that you want to reconcile with them and ultimately point them to Christ. When he says, never avenge yourselves, to me, it brings up Jesus, who says, and very controversially to our hearts, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And of course, he keeps going. So if we were to live exactly as Jesus calls us to live by the literal understanding of what he's saying, it seems like it puts Christians in a pretty vulnerable position. If all we're seeking to do is is never repay evil for evil, let vengeance be God's, live peaceably with all, try to do everything that's honorable in the sight of everybody, and then even endure persecution, it seems like it puts us in a pretty pretty rough spot. Yep. Is that encouraging to the Christian? How can we understand that? And here's where I think it's so important that we let Scripture interpret Scripture and understand what Jesus is saying when he says things like turn the other cheek. Um, you know, obviously, if someone breaks into my home at 3 a.m. and wants to rape my wife and kill my children, I'm not, I'm not going to turn the other cheek and let them do it. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to exercise my vocation as a husband and father and protect my family. And uh, if I have to use violence to, to, to protect them, I'll do that. Um, uh, I, I don't think Jesus is forbidding us from doing that. The kind of thing he is forbidding, though, is this attitude, oh, you hurt me? Now I'm going to hurt you back and make you suffer even more than you made me suffer. And even more than that, I hope you burn in hell one day. Um, It's that kind of attitude that Jesus wants us to repent of. And and so this idea, uh, it's one thing to do what needs to be done in a moment where you need to defend yourself and others. It's quite another thing to say, now I'm going to get back at you and make you suffer. Uh, That is the kind of thing that that Jesus is forbidding when he says, turn the other cheek. Yes, I'm glad you brought that out. That's what I was hoping would come across because it's important. And today when we struggle with how to respond to the persecutions against us as Christians, some are rising to the height of where it might require action. Yeah, we want to know. We want to be guided by the scriptures, but we also don't want to misunderstand or misinterpret the scriptures. In verse 13, when Paul was talking more about the those fellow Christians, he says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Then in verse 20, when he's talking more about how we respond to those who are against us, he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. I said at the very outset that I was really looking forward to that because what imagery. You know, he's been talking about how you you should live peaceably with all. Don't be haughty. Associate with the lowly. Don't take vengeance. It belongs to God. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Because when you do, boy, it's just going to make him mad. Or or what is the interpretation there? How can we understand keeping burning coals on his head? Great visual. Yeah, well, you know, these are one of those verses where there's a, a, a ton of different opinions. You know, it's actually a, a citation from... Uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 25. But the problem is when you read that section of Proverbs, it doesn't define what it means there either. <laughs> so we're left to okay. kind of speculate. But but I think uh, from the context, what we can say is this. Uh, I don't think Paul is saying, um, be nice to your neighbor as a way of getting back at him. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Right. That would go against everything he's just said. I, I think what he's saying here is, hey, um, uh, rather than, uh, you know, uh, getting even with your enemy, sh- show love for him and compassion, and that will result with burning coals on his head. And I'm just going to give you my opinion and others might okay. disagree, but I think this is an image of, you know, what would happen if we put burning coals on your head? Not only would that be painful, your head would probably turn red and, 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 and feel hot. And I think that the whole idea here is, is that when, when we return love for hatred, if if that person has any conscience left over at all, they're going to experience a sense of shame, uh, and and like wow, um, 
I've just treated this person horribly and now they're doing this to me. Uh, maybe I need to rethink my attitude. And, uh, or at the very least, th they might have a, uh, enough shame that they would ask us, listen, I just treated you like garbage and now you're doing this for me. Can you tell me why? And boy, then we have a perfect window opportunity to tell them about Jesus. But I think the point here is we're, we're not to show love for our enemy as a way of, of, it's not like we want to make them feel ashamed as a way of taking vengeance on them. But what we do want to do is help them to recognize their own evil behavior so that they can uh, have the opportunity of hearing from us that there is forgiveness and a new way of life in Jesus. Yeah, Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. And that's in Luke 6. So if we combine scripture, interpret scripture, if we combine Jesus's teaching with Paul's teaching and obviously his consistent insistence that you be merciful and peaceable, yeah, I think it would be difficult for us to conclude that this is a way of really you know, getting back at your neighbor. The, right. the motive for helping him is just to make him mad. But I yep. think of it very similar to what you think of it. We have this phrase of lighting a fire under somebody to get them moving. <laughs> Perhaps there's some connotation there where, you know, you get, he gets him thinking just what you said. You know, I, I was kind of a jerk to this Christian and he wasn't a jerk to me. And now he's, he's bothered by it. Yeah. I also think a little bit of, you know, this cleansing, you know, to the lips of the prophet Cole, this idea that there's this cleansing, you know, I, I don't want to read too much into it. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Even Proverbs, we don't know what exactly they're talking about here. We don't. It's probably an, an idiom that's lost to time, but boy, it sure is kind of fun to think about. And I think, but at the same time, it's important to know that we're not trying to be mean to people, but rather provoke them, induce them to come to the Savior. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's yeah, can I tell a goal. quick little story of how um, this tension between defending yourself and also loving your enemy can play out in real life. I'll, I'll be real quick. Okay. I have friends who were missionaries in Africa, and uh, uh, they were asleep one night in their house. They had just had a baby, and two men broke into their house and were robbing them while they were sleeping. And uh, the husband went downstairs to protect his wife and baby, as he should have, and in the process, they shot him in both legs. And they're out in rural Africa. They don't have a hospital to go to. They were scared he was going to bleed to death. Well, long story short, uh, they did save his life. They ended up back in America for a few months to recover from this. And then they went back to Africa. And he found out that these men who had robbed his house and shot him uh, were now in prison. He goes to prison to visit with them and tell them about Jesus and that he has forgiven them. So here I think, okay, on the one hand, when they were robbing his house and threatening his family, he was fighting them and trying to defend his family. But then when he had an opportunity, he went and said, I forgive you and let me tell you about Jesus. I think that's a perfect example of let's overcome evil with good. It's a beautiful illustration of how we work differently regarding the situation. We discern what's going on. We apply law and gospel appropriately. And in this case, that's a very, very incarnate way to apply law, and that is to fight back against evil. And then, of course, gospel, to reach out to that person in love after the fact. That's a beautiful illustration. I'm really glad you shared it with us. We just have a few minutes left in our show. Recall whatever you think is very important for the listeners to take home and leave us with a great gospel message, Pastor. Well, even though Paul has talked a lot about here's what is evil, don't do it. Here's what is good, embrace it. Um, uh, and this is, it, it, it's good. We, we should focus on this. Uh, the reality is in spite of our best efforts, we all fall short. Um, uh, uh, even when we have a quote unquote good week, uh, even if our behavior, uh, is on the whole good, we still have all these desires and thoughts in us that, that are, are tarnished. And so we have to remember what Paul says in view of God's mercy. Uh, or as Paul said, you know, in Romans 7, when I wanted to do good, evil is right there with me. Who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so here we see that, that we can be free to, to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind all the time, knowing that we are completely forgiven, loved, and holy in God thanks through Jesus. And so that, that's the gospel motivation for the new life in Christ. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Thomas Eckstein, pastor of Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota. Pastor, thank you for being on the show. 
Absolutely, my privilege. And I'm also grateful to you, dear Christian, for listening to Thy Strong Word. I've been your host, Pastor Phil Boo. We'll gather together around God's Word again tomorrow as we continue our study of Paul's letter to the Romans. Until then, God's peace and blessings with you all. Thank you.